Hello, good afternoon, everybody. Hi. 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 My name is Angie Grove, and I'm the executive director here at the Ethan Allen Homestead Museum. Welcome to the museum, and welcome to our monthly lecture series. Uh, this is one of the um, community enrichment events that we have for free for members of the community to come in, see the museum, and hear a historical talk and learn something new, hopefully enjoy themselves as well. Um, I really quickly want to give a couple of dates for other special events we have coming up. On uh, September 30th, we have the Home and Hearth reenactment event. That is a domestic living reenactment, how everyday life happened inside an 18th century house with a reenactor. Um, so come and check that out. And on that same day, September 30th, we're going to have our last archaeology discovery table where some of our volunteer archaeologists will be showing some of the research they've been doing about the digs that took place here in the 1990s and cataloging and organizing the artifacts. And you can see some of the artifacts. Which, by the way, September is Vermont Archaeology Month. So that's a part of uh, that statewide celebration. In October, on Saturday, October 14th, we have Flax Stravaganza, which is our big harvest celebration in October, um, focused mainly around our flax crop, which we grow here at the homestead, and reenactors are going to be here to turn that flax into homespun linen cloth. So uh, you want to come check that out as well. And then the following day is the October monthly lecture, and that is called Combined Operations in the Civil War by historian Rob Grandchamp. Um, that's about how Vermont and Rhode Island infantrymen worked together to um, really make a difference in the Northern victory in the Civil War. Okay. Uh, we have two other monthly talks after that. The one in November is going to be remote only. Um, our speaker is going to be zooming in from Scotland and it is a uh, speaker talking about Vermont allegiance during the Revolutionary War. And then the very last talk of the year in our monthly lecture series is for members only. So this is a special thing. We usually don't have one in December, but we're going to offer one for members of the museum only. Um, I'm actually going to be giving that talk, and it is titled Ethan Allen, an Infernal Villain. So make sure to come and check that out as well. And to uh, attend that talk, you just need to visit our front desk, or you can visit us online to purchase a membership. Uh, the Ethan Allen Homestead Museum is a nonprofit 501c3 museum, so your donations and memberships are tax deductible, um, but that also means we rely on donations and memberships from our community to survive and keep going. Okay, so uh, that's the business of the museum out of the way. Now we're going to get started with today's presentation. Um, Oh, one more thing for the business. Uh, I have to say thank you to the sponsors of our community enrichment program. Um, we have uh, three corporate sponsors, North Country Federal Credit Union, m and Bank, and Vermont AARP. Um, we also have one community partner for our monthly lecture series, and that is Town Meeting TV, or CCTV, um, who graciously record the lectures so we can put them up on our YouTube page later so we can reach more people with our mission. Okay, now I'm done with the business of the museum. Um, and so I'm actually not going to introduce the speaker. I'm going to introduce you to the person who's going to introduce the speaker. Um, this is our newest board member, um, which board members are also volunteer positions, so in some ways our newest volunteer to the Ethan Allen Homestead Museum. Um, and I would like you to help me welcome uh, this early American historian at Norwich University, Zachary Bennett. Hello, everyone. Today, um, we will be talking about Remember Baker. 251 years ago, in March of 1772, tensions between New Yorkers of the Green Mountain Boys uh, escalated, escalated, known as Yorkers. In the middle of the night, Yorkers broke into Remember Baker's home, attacked him and his wife, Desire, capturing Remember Baker. This presentation will cover his capture by the Yorkers and then his rescue 
by the Green Mountain Boys. The Baker incident led up to the 250th anniversary of the founding of the Independent Republic of Vermont in 1777, um, a few years later after this incident. But I would say, as a historian, that in 1772, this is not, this has nothing to do with, maybe, maybe I'll be corrected on this, <laughs> with the American Revolution, with American independence, and all of the things that um, this museum kind of focuses on and celebrates, and when we think of Ethan Allen, um, 1772 is only a few years be before kind of the crisis of Lexington and Concord in uh, Massachusetts in 1775, but um, there's actually this great quote that Benjamin Franklin wrote later in his life, which he said, in 1775, I had never heard any in any conversation from any person drunk or sober the least expression of a wish for a separation from Great Britain or a hint that such a thing would be advantageous to America. So this event uh, takes place within a colonial context, within a British Empire context. And what I really love is the names in, in, in this event. Remember Baker is a great Puritan name, right? It, it calls you to remember the Lord, to remember God. Um, these names were very common at this time, leading to my favorite New England name ever, Preserved Fish. This was a real, this was a real person. You can look him up. He's actually pretty, pretty important. Um, but this contest, so just kind of a little bit of a wider context here, is that at simultaneously as this event in 1772, Maryland is fighting a quasi-war with Pennsylvania. Virginia is also at war, unofficially, kind of, with Pennsylvania as well, dealing with disputes over what is now the state of Pennsylvania and where those colonies disagreed on where their lines were, and they were literally shooting at each other. So what that speaks to is, and I, this I'm sure will be highlighted in the, the, the talk, is that Americans were not united at all. They were not united against Britain. They were not united among themselves. And something that I think this will hope, hopefully highlight is that it's really amazing at all that Americans united to fight the British in the War of Independence, and that Americans, even more surprisingly than that, united to create a country uh, with a common government. We have maybe this idea that back in the day, you know, this age of polarization that we're in, this is like a new thing. We used to get along back in the day. Um, Mr. Teagart will show us that is not the case. This has always, always been like this. But anyways, a little bit about our, our speaker. Mr. Teagart moved to Vermont about six years ago from Clinton, New York, where he was actively involved in history as a director of the Clinton Historical Society and chair of the Clinton Historic Preservation Commission. He is currently president of the Bennington Historical Society and administrator of the Bennington Museum Regional History Room. He also serves as a commissioner on the Bennington Hist Historic Preservation Commission. He and his wife, Beth, live on Elm Street, if you want to say hi, in Bennington, Vermont. And with that, I'll okay. turn Thanks it over to you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, do you remember Baker? <laughs> um, this is a story about the conflicts of the New Hampshire grants leading to the creation of what is now Vermont. Um, you know, we got the Green Mountain Boys who are fighting for their lands. So this is the tale of, the, uh, of what Remember Baker did. He was a marked man for what his, his actions were, and his capture and then his release, his rescue. But to keep a few things in mind, um, keep a few things in mind, to keep a few things in mind, <laughs> <laughs> oh, down means down means up. Um, so in this timeline, like the gentleman just mentioned, in the context of the revolution, this is well before. You know, you've got you've got some activity in New England. You got the Boston Massacre. You got the uh, some of the other items going on, Stamp Act. But this is uh, still early in the colonial period. His abduction is in 1772. 1773 is a Tea Party, and Lexington conquered, and it carries on from there. So this is, this is early on. Now I'm going to push the down button. There you go. But um, who's behind all this controversy? Who's the cast of characters that, that uh, 
shaped this conflict and created Vermont. The well, first guy we got is Benning Wentworth. He really, I like to say, started the problem. He, uh, he was governor of, of New Hampshire from 1741 to 1766. And during that time, he chartered 131 townships in the New Hampshire Grants, which is now Vermont, 131, under a royal directive. So this is, this is still you know, actions coming from London, granting him the ability to grant townships. Um, so 130, he just went crazy. And each time he made one of these grants, uh, he didn't sell them or grant them to people who were going to settle there. No, he granted them to investors and speculators. So they paid him a little bit of money to get the grant, and he taxed them. And he, so he made a bundle of money doing this. Um, but these people never visited the townships or planned to live there. Um, but he was collecting the fees each time and claiming a few plots for himself. And he accumulated over 100,000 acres and a sizable fortune. Um, and here's the one of the, in 1749, he, uh, he chartered Bennington. And you can see, now this light doesn't work up here anymore, I guess, but see BW, Bennington Wentworth up in the upper right-hand corner. He took a little plot for himself. There's another one down here, Bennington Wentworth. So he, he took a few town little plots for himself, free of charge, I'm sure, and the rest of them he sold to all these other investors, none of whom will ever really come and live in Bennington. So, but he chartered these on a very complicated issue. Um, and it's funny, you know, I should say he, he called this Bennington, basically after himself, yeah. Benning Wentworth. It also was his mother's maiden name. But this was the town grant. Um, and it's funny, I visited a uh, historical society in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, the capital of New Hampshire, and I went to a museum, and they were talking about Benning Wentworth. They weren't too pleased with him. He was kind of a stodgy guy. He had a home, and he wanted to have them convert it to the governor's mansion and buy it from him. And they said no, so he promptly left the house and built his own house on the sea so, seashore and lived happily ever after. He wasn't happy. He wasn't very well received. But um, on, the, on the New York side, the New York claimants, these are the people mainly from New York City and downstate, they also obtained grants in this area for profit, um, but they were using a different pattern of settlement. They weren't going to live there. They weren't going to. They weren't going. They were going to rent it out on an English pattern of, of and a Dutch pattern of land ownership, of patroon patroonships, uh, quit rents, and like Downton Abbey, they would grant these lands to farmers and charge them a rent each year. Um, and these are the people making decisions. Here's George Clinton. He's governor of New York. He was involved in the land disputes. And it was said on all occasions, he had the most bitter animosity towards the people of Vermont. He advocated violence and hostility and supported rewards for Ethan Allen and others, dead or alive, who were defending the rights of the New Hampshire grants. There also was uh, Governor Tyron, who was a landowner. But this guy here, John Tabor Kemp, I cannot get away from this guy. When I was in central New York studying the settlement of Clinton, New York, he owned all the land in central New York. He came from a family, the Cox family. They were great landovers and landowners, and they owned, had a patent for land, a large land track of land um, in North Carolina and Georgia. And at that time, the borders were very fluid. I think it went all the way to the Pacific. And he had lots of land, and the king finally decided, no, this is too good. We've got to rescind this grant. We're going to swap you with 100,000 acres in upstate New York. So he had the townships of Clinton and Oneida County and a lot of the central New York areas, New Jersey. So during that time with the New Hampshire grants, this guy already has lots of land in the area. And he became Attorney General of New York, so he had a lot of power. Another guy was involved with New York, on New York side, John Duane. He was a lawyer. And he married smart. He married Mary Livingston, who was a daughter of Robert Livingston, another great landowner in New York. You hear of Livingston County, New York. There's Livingston Manor. Again, this manor idea of land ownership 
So he married into the Livingston clan, and they were all set. Um, and John Monroe, I don't have his picture, but he was a sheriff for New York, and he lived in White Creek and also, I believe, Shaftesbury, and he was the enforcer. A Scottish immigrant, he got his job from Duane. He was buddies with Duane and Kemp. Um, and he followed New York orders to get the, these rioters and this Bennington mobsters out of the New Hampshire grants. What was his motivation? Yeah, probably greed, patronage. Uh, so he was, he was all set. But um, the, the Vermont guys, the Vermont people, the New Hampshire grantees, I should call them. There was no Vermont at this time. That was not even used. Uh, they settled the land. These were the Vermont, <laughs> the New Hampshire grantee types. They settled the land. They cleared the land. They built homes. They settled Bennington. They settled all the, a lot of areas. Um, they knew the lands. They cleared the land. They desired to settle, build a community, build churches, build schools. Um, if you look at the plot of Bennington, they had a plot for the church, they had a plot for schools, they, they wanted to build a community. Uh, they came for religious reasons, they came from political reasons, you know, economic, social reasons, to own and create communities. So it was different, a different culture with the New Hampshire grantees than those guys in New York who were just speculators and large landowners. So this was the Bennington mob, guys like Ethan Allen. Seth Warner, remember Baker, Robert Cochran, Stafford Breckenridge, all guys that had a mark on their head for them in New York. Um, but like, like the speaker told us, they were all loyal subjects of the crown. They were not against Great Britain. They were not against the king. They tried to work with the king to reach a solution. Um, they weren't revolutionaries by any means. Um, even the Vermont Declaration of Independence, uh, rather than addressing crimes of Great Britain, they addressed crimes of New York. So, but as, as you know, you know, the whole controversy started with, with this, with when they set up Massachusetts, they had the line 20 miles from the Hudson River, and it went straight up. That was the boundary of Massachusetts. Well, in Benning Wentworth, I um, already knew that they, we had a Fort Dummer, um, which was in New Hampshire there in, in the Grants, so that was considered okay. So he assumed that that same rule would apply and the land would carry over 20 miles from the Connecticut River. You know, I used to, when I used to commute from uh, New York to Vermont, I used to cross them from New York border and think, well, I'm in Vermont now. I used to cross the Hudson, I should say. I think I'm in New York now, or in Vermont now. I keep driving those 20 miles till you get to Vermont. So, but that was, that was the, the border that Benning Wentworth and the New Hampshire grantees thought would be the border of Vermont, of the New Hampshire grants. Not so. New York thought the, the line was the Connecticut River, way the other side. So on it went. And I got a spam account on my phone here. Spam call, we'll get rid of that. Um, so that was, that was the problem. That was the, the province of the grants, the New Hampshire grants. That was the, that was the issue, the disputed border. And in 1770, you know, the grantees tried to sue, and uh, they were, the court ruled in favor of the New York grants. So that became a serious problem. And to deal with London, you know, to get a message from here to London and back, you're talking months, if not years, you know, to get an answer from the king. So it was, the communication wasn't that great. So there was talk about, you know, going to the grantee side or not, or this or that. So it was never clear. It was never cleared. It was always a controversy. So they started ejectment trials. And they started to, to actually go in and try to eject these New Hampshire grantees from their land. Um, there was a guy named Silas Robinson. Um, was arrested, taken to Albany, um, and before he could be rescued, he was, he was incited for riot, imprisoned for one year. So New Yorkers were serious about this. 
1771, leading up to Baker's abduction, Sheriff and Monroe and 12 others went to Samuel Rose's house in Manchester. Uh, he was not there. They entered his house. A large group of neighbors approached, um, and they, they told his wife she was now a tenant. But they didn't eject her. They left. Uh, they also turned another fellow, Mr. Carpenter, out of his premises. And he was alarmed for his safety, and he fled. And then there was a well-known event in, near Bennington, the Breckenridge standoff. John Breckenridge had a land in the a house in the Grants uh, on the in, in Vermont, um, and Monroe and the boys came, and they, they were going to eject him from his house. Well, at this point, the Green Mountain boys came. And they were arrayed on a ridge near the house, and they also were in the house. And Sheriff Monroe looked at him, and the guys, his posse looked at the guys with the guns and said, hey, I didn't sign up for this. I didn't sign up for a gun battle. I this was going to get this guy and drag him off to Albany. So they just dispersed, and they left Breckenridge alone. So this was an important, important stage in the, in the controversy. And the, this, at this point, the Green Mountain Boys were organized. Um, the New Yorkers continued to eject people, but they had town meetings in, in the grants uh, to resist ejectment by force. And what they did, and they never really, they never really killed anybody, but they would approach somebody's, uh, a New Yorker's squatter's house, maybe burn it down, maybe whip them. They would whip them with beach seal, they called it. They would take beach limbs and whip them and drive them out of the area. So they were, they were serious guys. So a militia was formed. And several companies of volunteers, including Seth Warner, remember Baker, a troublemaker, Robert Cochran and others, Ethan Allen, Seth Warner, um, and they became known as the Green Mountain Boys, or as the New York called them, the Bennington Mob. So they began this to defend their properties with whatever means they could find. Um, you know, I had great fun with this project because I could look at the, there's a documentary history of New York which has all the correspondence at this era. And um, you can see just everything that's going on. In uh, one of the first letters I found, was just to show you the type of violence that was occurring. I've got to put my glasses on now. Uh, William Cockburn was a surveyor. And he said, I found it in vain to persist any longer as it were resolved at all events to stop us. There had been many threats pronounced against me. Gideon Conley, who lives by the Great Falls, was to shoot me. And your acquaintance, Nathan, Nathan Allen, I got the name wrong, was in the woods with another party of blacked and dressed like Indians. That's like the Boston Tea Party, as I was informed. Several of my men can prove that they were threatening my life. Assure me these men intended to murder us if we did not go from hence. On my assuring that I would survey no more in these parts, I was permitted to leave. So the surveyor from New York was not going to do it anymore. And then another one, Charles Hutchinson, uh, said they resolved to offer a burnt sacrifice to the gods of the world and burning of the logs of my house. They kindled four fires of logs of the house. Allen and Baker were holding clubs over the despondents and ready to strike. And Ethan Allen said to the, to the settler, Go your way now and complain to that damn scoundrel, your governor. God darn your governor, laws, king, council, and assembly. So they were, they were serious about this. And as a result, um, Governor Tyron he offered $20 reward for Allen, Baker, and those guys. Um, $20 reward for their capture with these Bennington mobs. But Ethan Allen 
responded by saying, and I got it up here now, whereas James Duane and John Kemp, our two buddies here of New York, have by their menaces and threats greatly distributed the public peace and repose of honest peasants of Bennington and the settlements of the Northwood, which peasants are now and ever been in peace of God and the king and patriotic allegiance of George III, any person who will apprehend these common disturbers and bring them to the, Lord, the landlord phase at Bennington shall have a 15-pound reward for John Duane and for John Kemp, paid by Ethan Allen, Robert Baker, and Robert Cochran. So they, were, they went right back. They went back with a, a reward for those James Duane and John Kemp. So that's the position we were in at the point where, remember, Baker was captured. And again, I, I had a lot of fun with this because I, I tried to go back. Um, you know, we know he was a man with a reward on his head, uh, part of the Bennington mob. Um, and the Bennington, this story is based on a lot of folklore. It's tough when you get to this era to get to what the real facts were. And I tried to, my darndest, to figure out their route and their speed and how he got there and what happened. But uh, it, it's mainly it's information passed down, down, and down. You know, Highland Hall and other 19th century authors had a, a story. Um, New England Quarterly, Stanley Baker had another version. Uh, it's all kind of slanted. So I decided to look at some contemporary works, and I found the Hartford Current of April 1772 and March of 1772, and I found these descriptions, but I, then I found out they were written by Ethan Allen. <laughs> so, so much for that. Um, but using these reports, I think I could re reconstruct just what happened. Um, here is Arlington today. It's a quiet little village. Um, and here is actually the mill that Ethan Allen used. It's still standing. It's, uh, it was an antique shop for a while. I don't know what it is now, but it's still, it's still there. There's a better shot of it. At that point, it was an antique store. And that's Ethan Allen standing in front of it. <laughs> <laughs> The mill built in 1761 by, remember, Baker, the Green Mountain Boys, this National Register of Historic Places. So uh, this is not his house, but this is what's left. The house is gone, but this was nearby. That's still there. And that's a nearby barn. I think it probably is the same era. But um, so let's go back to, um, to March 21st, 1772. John Monroe arrived uh, with Sheriff Steph Stevens and about 12 men, and the, they were reportedly mostly Scotsmen for some reason. Monroe was a Scottish immigrant. Maybe he got all his laddies together and said, have you a pint and we'll go out and have some fun. So he took his men, and he, um, he arrived around daybreak in the silence of the night. So daybreak... It was around 7 a.m. in Vermont at this time, in March. Um, so Baker was still in bed. Uh, they surrounded the house. They discharged guns at the house. And they broke down the front door with broad axes. Of course, they're Scotsmen. They got their broad axes, you know. Um, and Baker's wife tried to defend the door with one of her axes. Um, Edward MacDonald struck her with his cutlass. And crippling her for life. This is the this is where the folklore comes in. Was she really crippled for life, or was she uh, given a good whack? But she she was injured. Then they went through the house. They mauled his 12 year old son. And they uh, they cut a gash in his cheek, supposedly. They looted the house. And Monroe swore, by the God, he would have Baker dead or alive and burn the house, wife, and children, and all the effects. Nice guy, you know? Nice guy. So what's Baker going to do? He kind of retreated. Now, here's where it gets kind of funky, because I don't know how the house was constructed. He retreated to his chamber. 
Now, this may have been a one-story house. Maybe it was very similar to Ethan Allen's homestead out here. But he retreated to his chamber with sword and gun, but was overpowered. He broke a board off the wall and leaped from the house. And he landed a snowbank up to his middle. He was quickly surrounded by what some people call bandides. Um, and the constable set his dog on Baker. Baker struggled. McDonald slashed at Baker with his sword. He was struck in the wrist, cutting off his thumb. So here he is, waist high in the snow, a dog attacking him, and the guy attacked him with a sword, cut his thumb off. He's still in his nightshirt. And he was bound and he was thrown into either a sleigh or a carriage or a horse. I'm not sure. I had different variations on this. But he was put in some kind of convenience. And Monroe told the terrified family he was taking Baker to Albany to be jailed, condemned, and executed. That's pretty serious for somebody who's just squatting on land, but that's the story. Um, some neighbors saw this. They, Neighbors Caleb Henderson and John Wishton heard the ruckus, and they attempted to rescue Baker. But they were, of course, overcome by this posse of 12 men. And uh, one of them was captured, and the other guy escaped and fled to Bennington, which is probably 20 miles from, from Arlington, so it's quite a ways. Um, and he escaped to Bennington to sound the alarm. I don't know how he got to Bennington, how he traveled to Bennington, but he got to Bennington. Now, Monroe wanted to avoid the boys in Bennington. He wanted to avoid <coughs> Ethan Allen and all those nasty Green Mountain boys that were down there. So he traveled due west, east from East Arlington, with Baker, secured in the sleigh. Now, I, difficult to trace the route. I, I got kind of crazy. I wanted to trace the route. I wanted to figure out how fast he could go. So I figured, well, if he's on a horse, I looked up how fast a horse could go. I looked up how fast a sleigh could go, and I got kind of nuts. But, uh, but uh, So there's no real documentation, and the roads have changed considerably from that time. Um, so I found an article by a guy in 1994 and some other sources, and I could deduce some of those that, that travel the present route 313 to Junction 212. That doesn't mean much to you, but they're going down to Eagle Bridge. And, uh, and they're actually, there's, there's Remember Baker with his thumb cut off. That's from a reenactment we did last year of the, of the standoff of the abduction. But here's the route. They would have come up here, down, heading towards, towards Albany that way to get to, to Troy, to get to Troy, to get the ferry, to get across, to go. They trailed about 17 miles, now North Hoosick, which should be down below here someplace. There they, there they rested and they tried to dress his wounds. And one source I found that the constable's dog followed the sleigh or whatever, licking up the blood of Baker's wounds. Uh, yeah, right. Um, meanwhile, the people in Bennington uh, were alerted of Monroe's actions uh, by Caleb Henderson and gathered about, gathered together about 10 men. Uh, and I've got, I actually got a listing of the men, They're both from Bennington and Arlington, who joined in. Uh, Ethan was not around that day. I don't know whether he was what he was doing. Maybe he was at the Catamount Tavern uh, resting or something. But he didn't join them, but uh, he was not part of the posse. They left Bennington around noon. So noon, so maybe like 7 a.m., the abduction started. Uh, the guy had to get from Arlington to Bennington to warn them, and then they had to get organized. So it wasn't until noon that they set out to try to rescue Baker. And they traveled, if you're familiar with the southern New York Route 7, goes very straight across. They could go out Route 7. So they had a rather quick route, and they were mounted, so they could travel a lot faster than this other posse with sleighs or whatever they had. Um, 
and they were aiming for the Troy Ferry, which is the bottom heart there. Um, now, Monroe would have several hours lead, but the Bennington guys could, of course, go faster because they were mounted. Um, so they arrived at the ferry about 3 p.m. So now, you know, figure 3 p.m. Now Baker has been for about six hours at least tied up in his nightshirt with his thumb cut off and in the middle of winter. Um, they can make a better sense. They arrived at the ferry around 3 and they couldn't, they didn't see Monroe's band because they figured that's where they were going to go to get across the, the ferry. Um, so they turned north, back up north to pursue them. Um, so they went about seven miles north of Troy, and uh, they met up with, with Monroe and his men. Now at this point, here's 10 guys from Bennington. There's like 12 guys from uh, the Scotsman there. Uh, they met, and Monroe and his men said, again, I didn't sign up for this gunfight. I'm out of here. So they just ran off into a swamp and they were gone, leaving Monroe and Baker by themselves. So uh, they rescued Baker, um, and was, yeah, Monroe's men fled into a swamp. Baker was rescued. Monroe was captured. Uh, another, another thing is they, they captured Monroe, but they didn't keep him. They let him go. They got rid of him. So there they are. They got Baker now, and they've, they're going to get him home. And here's, here's a road. Yeah, again, I got crazy here. This shows the, the mountainous. This is the only way they could go, cross the mountains at the top and right straight down. So the roads followed the terrain, and that's where I figured was their route. But so they got, they've got uh, Baker, and Monroe was, they just let him go. He said, okay, go. They got rid of him. And Colonel Safford was there. He dressed Baker's wounds, and they put him on a horse, and they sent out for Bennington. So they're going to take him home. Um, they stopped at a house on the Hoosick River and uh, to rest and take care of, of the wounds. Um, and then crossing the river, uh, they came upon another group, another group of people laying in ambush. Now, is this, who is this now? Is this, is this more of Monroe's boys, a second line of defense? Well, fortunately, before the guns went off, they realized it was a group from Arlington. Arlington, they'd come over, and they were also in pursuit of of the Monroe and trying to get Baker. So they, luckily they met up and they continued along Route 7 uh, and they got back to the Breckenridge House, which is south of Bennington on the Willemsack River near Henry Bridge, one of our covered bridges, about 2 a.m. So now we started at 7 a.m. and now it's all the way around, it's like they traveled 83 miles in, uh, in about 20 hours. So this is all mounted in the middle of winter, or well, March, which is winter in Vermont, let's admit it. Um, and, um, and Monroe was cheesed off because he thought, uh, you know, we, they could have resisted these, these guys from Bennington, but, uh, but the men, disobeyed his orders and took off. You know, they weren't going to, like I say, they didn't sign up for a gun, gun fight. Um, so Seth, and then they took, took him back to Breckenridge. Seth Warner later wanted to get back, remember Baker's rifle. So he went to Monroe's house, banged on the door and said, I want remember Baker's gun back. Monroe refused to give him the gun, so Seth Warner seized the bridle of Monroe's horse. Oh no, excuse me, Monroe returned it and he seized the, the bridle of, uh, of Seth Warner's horse and told the constable to arrest Seth Warner. Well, before that could happen, Warner drew his cutlass, whacked Monroe with a flat of it, knocked him on the ground, took the musket and rode off. And the town of Pulteney awarded him with 100 pounds for his labor in cutting the head of Esquire Monroe the Yorkie. So he was rewarded for that. And later, Monroe was, was treated terrified by threats by the Green Mountain Boys. They were shooting their guns around his house. They would surround it at night. They uh, burned some of his property. They threatened him. 
And it got so bad that uh, Monroe uh, had to quit. He had to quit his position of, of uh, sheriff. Um, and the, he said, the riders in this part of the country are enlisting daily. And they're offering 15 pounds bounty to every man that joins with them and the strike terror in the whole country. Well, I'm not sure if that's true or not. But um, um, so he, he actually had enough, and he quit. And, um, but the, as a result, the Bennington, the Green Mountain Boys continued to be organized. Uh, riders were brought back to Bennington, two pieces of cannon and a mortar piece in the small fort at East Hoosick, making great preparations for defense. And a body of regulars were on the march. So the Green Mountain Boys had been established. And they continued to harass, and Baker, among them, continued to harass surveyors and other folks. But you know, Baker got back. They got back to Breckenridge. They dressed his wounds. He went home. And he, I won't say he lived happily ever after. Um, but that was, the, that was the capture and release of Baker. And the resulting, this was a real turning point. Some people say the Breckenridge standoff was the founding of Vermont, but I would say that this was the real turning point when they really became united. But it was still well before the revolution. And by 1774, this whole issue kind of died out with the revolution. They kind of put it aside, and Fort Ticonderoga happened, and they moved on with the revolution. But uh, they continued before that to, to threaten people, to burn their houses, to kick them out of their land. And reading some of these, say, these documents, are amazing how these people were so terrified about the Green Mountain Boys. They would come, they would whip people, they would burn their property, they would threaten them, they would tell them to get out of town, and they did. Um, But the issue, you know, wasn't settled till like 1791, when Vermont became a state, um, and we had to pay thirty thousand dollars to New York. Uh, that, I figure that's about a million dollars in today's money. Um, pay to New York to settle the claims. So we caved into them a little bit, I guess. Um, and I looked at the uh, so yeah, Vermont entered the Union as the 14th state. Um, along with Kentucky, to balance the powers, north and south at that point. You can see the starting of another problem. Uh, and two stars were added to the flag at that time. But uh, Vermont had to pay 76 claimants this money. And I had a listing of some of those claimants. James Duane, he got $26,000 for 53,000 acres. Cockburn, another one of his buddies, at 1,500, a guy named Isaac Roosevelt, who was a great uncle of Theodore Roosevelt, he got $400. So we had to pay some of these, these Yorkers for the rights to own the land grants. But, uh, and what became of these guys? Uh, John Kemp, he became a loyalist. And you know, a lot of these loyalists after the war, during the war, they lost their properties. Um, they fled to Canada, and they fled to, they went to England. And he had a sad ending. He was thrown from a carriage in London and died in 1792. John Kemp, penniless probably. Duane lives on. He was mayor of New York City, a judge. In the legislature, he fought against Vermont interests. So he did OK. He died in Schenectady Livingston. He continued to practice law and manage his large estate. So he, most of them made out pretty well, with the exception of the loyalists. George Clinton, who was the governor of New York at one time, became famous in New York history. And Clinton, New York, was named after him. Um, he was also vice president of the United States. Uh, Monroe, whatever happened to our friend Monroe? <laughs> he died penniless, without money, friends or interests. He wrote a letter to one of his, I think Dwayne or somebody, begging for some support, and they said, eh, we don't need you anymore. So he died penniless. Benning Wentworth, he used his permission of the governor to you know, really entrench his family in the economic and political dominance in, in New Hampshire. And 
in the 1760s in the dispute with the colonial governments in neighboring New York, um, let an end to the land grants, and he eventually stepped down as governor. But he, uh, he, he, he died four years later, and I think he, his nephew, John Wentworth, assumed the governorship, so the family carried on. But the Green Mountain Boys, they, were, they, they continued. They, in the Revolutionary War, Fort Ticonderoga. Um, and remember, remember Baker was there. He went with Ethan Allen mm -hmm. to Fort Ticonderoga. The Battle of Bennington was fought in Bennington, turning point of the revolution. So the Green Mountain Boys continued to fight, now resist the crown, finally. Remember Baker? He continued to serve. He served at Fort Ticonderoga. Um, he went to an expedition to Canada yeah, shortly after that in 1775. Unsuccessful expedition. Uh, he was out scouting. I got pictures I could be showing you too. He was out scouting. Uh, he was a known scout. He had fought in the French and Indian War. He was a longtime veteran, but he was captured by the Indians and he was beheaded. And uh, the Indians took his head and took it to uh, Quebec, I believe. And uh, the British were so upset about this that they took the head back and had it buried formally. Um, but he was, he was known as our first, remember Baker. Um, he was the first American killed in Canada in the War of the American Revolution. His death made more noise in the country than the loss of a thousand men towards the end of the American War. Ira Allen, of course, Ira Allen would say that. But um, he was killed, so he had that inglorious death, I guess. But that's the story. That's the story of Remember Baker. A troublemaker was captured, rescued, went on to fight, and had a ending. And that's where we got Vermont from. <laughs> Take any questions or any comments or any, uh, yeah. How old was he when he died? How old was he when he died? Blimey, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, he probably would. 40s, I bet you. These guys didn't live that long and they, <laughs> yeah. He was in the French Indian War, so that's 1750s, so 20, yeah, 40s. Yeah. He lived down with no thumb. What kind of mill was it? A lumber mill? A grain, grain mill, yeah, grist mill. Yeah. Bakersfield and Africa? Where is Bakersfield? I bet you, yeah, I bet you it is. Yeah, that you it is. Yeah. 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 Was Ethan actually leading the Green Mountain Boys during all this period? Well, he, w he led the Green Mountain Boys at Fort Ticonderoga. Yeah. But at one point, they had a, a, a meeting. You know, they're very democratic in this militia, and they elect their officers. And uh, they elected Seth Warner as the officer. So he, he got kicked out. So at the, battle, at the Battle of Bennington, he was actually on the, the, uh, in jail, in the British jail and ship, and Seth Warner was in charge in, at the Battle of Bennington. Yeah? I've got a question about the, uh, the state line between Vermont and New Hampshire. It's the low water mark on the western shore. That extends that? from New York um, border pre-colonial in the colonial era? Uh, that's my understanding. Got me. <laughs> You're talking about the eastern border of the state line, yeah. The between Vermont and New Hampshire. Vermont and Hampshire alongside yeah. the Connecticut River. It's the, so it's the legally is the low water mark on the Vermont side. Okay, I probably that's that makes sense. Yeah, that's and there is I vaguely remember some case about they tried to take that course to the case to the Supreme Yeah. Court. I seem to remember something like that. 
Yeah. Boundaries are weird. These, these, you know, look at the, the border of Vermont. Um, where's that picture I had of? Whoops. How can I get back there? Go this way? I don't know. I had a picture of Vermont here someplace. Technology strikes again. It's probably a quicker way to do this, but there it is. Yeah, I mean, the border, you know, why did it have that little jig jag down? It goes up and then cuts back down again. And then you got, you know, the lake was cool. And then when it gets up to Canada, it's, it's all wiggle wag. It's, people have done a lot of studies on how they made borders in the, all the states, and it gets crazy, you know. It's still there. Yeah, yeah. Well, I guess especially the Canadian border. There's a couple of places that are buildings right on the border. The library that the border is right on the middle of the library. And the, yeah, one side you're Canadian, one side, side you're, you know, yeah. So the Battle of Bennington is actually fought in Woonsack, New York. Yes. Okay, because when you said the Battle of Bennington was in Bennington. No, it was uh, well, it was the Battle of Bennington. The objective of the battle was the was the Bennington military stores. Right. And so it was battle for ben battle for Bennington. That was that was people have argued about that why they called the battle of Bennington. It was battle for Bennington. Yeah. It's worth saying I think that Baker and Allen were cousins. Yes, that's right. And I meant to say that they were first cousins. Baker and Seth one or two. Yeah. And Baker's progeny married uh, Mercy Standard from Georgia, who was uh, related to General George Standard. So his his. Yeah. his uh, his, his life lived on. Yeah. Well, they were a small community. They all interwoven. Yeah. Yeah, good point. I meant to mention that. Yeah. Did Thomas Paine and Ethan Allen ever hook up or perhaps read each other's literature? It's a good one. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, Ethan Allen wrote that, that, uh, that book of his, that Wisdom of... Uh, yeah, yeah, and I'm sure he must have thought about things a lot, but, yeah. Yo. Before we go, I, I don't think Tom Simon is here, but I got an email from Tom, and he said, this uh, tea garden is a Yorker capturing him. Oh. I'm sure him that you are now a full place of Yes, I've, uh... <laughs> We do have refreshments out there. We have cider, we have cabbage cheese and crackers, and snicker noodles. Oh my gosh. Hang around for a few minutes afterward and grab something and take something with you. Okay. By the way, that picture you have of the uh, Remember Baker Monument is in Noyon, Quebec. So if you drive up is it? the islands, Quebec, okay. across the border, yeah. and the next town is Noyon, and it's right there on the extension of the Because he's probably. It's called Remember Point. He may be buried up there, even, I suppose. Yeah, because you know, they. Yeah, cause they it's, it's near where. Yeah, he must be. I bet you they buried him in Canada because they was they were very upset that the Indians did that to him. And they... Could you all please join me in thanking our speaker? <laughs>